Oh, Luke 12 is where we're going to be. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Uh, church, thank you so much for your prayers for, uh, for me and my family. Let me just tell you that uh, I did not expect to go out and get me a case of the COVID, but I did. And uh, I'm here to, to testify that I praise God that he is faithful and that my symptoms were really, really mild. Um, there were three things I was really, really, really sad about and had to wrestle through. Number one is uh, the, the potential exposure to people that we love. And I think Lori and I cried and we just shared some words with each other where you just sit there and go, you don't realize the people that, we're people people. You know, we're, we're around people constantly and whether it be church or, or the business. Um, so um, my apologies to you if we interacted and uh, I disrupted your life and you had to go get tested. Um, Never my intentions, and uh, so sorry, and that's just one of those things you have to wrestle through, and, and uh, praise God for, uh, for a lot of you who just got negative test results. So, um, um, so number two is just forcing myself to rest and relax and not feel guilty for just catching up on sleep. Boy, I, I slept in uh, till 7 o'clock, which for me, that's sleeping in in the morning, all right? So uh, praise God for that, and then the other tough part about this is just missing Thanksgiving, with people you, you know and love, and it was just our immediate family of five, and um, so just appreciate your prayers, and uh, I'm praying for you. Uh, stay vigilant, stay healthy, um, just be aware of, of people around you, and uh, just thankful to be back, and uh, also want to just let you know as a church, um, we've had opportunities to bless people this holiday season. I just want you to know that uh, we have been sending gifts uh, abroad. We've been blessing people here locally. And as a church, what we believe is that uh, we've been blessed to be a blessing to others. And I just want you to know a couple, couple little stories real quick. Slovenia, you know, we have, a, we have a connection to Pastor Zvanko and what God is doing in Slovenia. And they're on like extreme lockdown as a country. And um, they reached out and said, hey, we have a need to to go um, virtual. We don't have the equipment, cameras, or things like that. And I said, why should that prevent you from sending the message of Jesus out to your, your community? So we as a church bought them everything they need to send out their messages virtually. So that's awesome. So, uh, you know, the virus thinks it can throw up some barriers. Guess what? The gospel knows no barriers. And so Pastor Zvanko and other church plants that are going on just say thank you to this little church in Chandler, Arizona for blessing them so the message of Jesus can go out. So thank you. We've been able to bless families. About $1,500 worth of Fry's gift cards have gone out to people who are just having a difficult time and people we know and people we don't know. Guess what? It doesn't matter. If we've been blessed, we can now be a blessing to others. So those are just a couple examples of how we are able, especially this holiday season, to encourage other people in Christ. So thank you, church, for your generosity. Appreciate you so much. Luke 12, turn there in your Bibles, if you would. It's good to be back in Luke. Um, I thought maybe Luke would be a year journey. It's, it's probably a two-year journey in, in Luke, so we're only halfway through. And uh, this is good. This is a good section. Um, this has been a, it doesn't need to be said, but it's been a difficult year for people. And um, as you might guess, Bible searches online have increased. So Bible searches, people turning to Scripture to address certain concerns, certain fears. Um, one of the most popular apps out there is the U version of the Bible. It was created by a church, I think they're in Oklahoma. Mo one of the most downloaded apps, right? They alone have seen this year an 80% increase in searching the Scriptures. And 600 million searches total worldwide to date for this year. 600 million people. And guess what the most popular Bible verse is that's been searched? Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. You know what it says? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The number one verse. And what does that tell you? It tells you that there's fear. And there's a fear that is a, a, a wrong fear, and there's a fear that's actually a right fear, right? We, we tend to fear the wrong things. The Bible says, it doesn't say don't fear, it just says don't fear the things that really are not reality. So we look at this and we go, okay, 
Lord, how do you address these concerns? How do you address these issues? It's interesting, if you track what people search in the scripture, fear has been the number one topic. This verse is the number one verse. But guess what would happen when, when there were some, some racial tensions going on in our country, and as if they're over. They're still there. But when things were happening, guess what the number one search was? Justice. Guess what it's been recently? Healing. It's interesting how people, culture, the world, when we're navigating these different seasons, we move from, from fear to justice to healing. But this is the number one topic right now. And it's the number one topic in our hearts, if we're honest. And we are here this morning, not by accident, but because we need to be reminded of things that are ultimately important. I'm not here to tell you don't fear. I'm going to argue this morning that you ought to start fearing the correct things. Fear plays an important role in our lives. I can't tell you how many times my parents put fear into me. Why? Because there is fear instilled to avoid things that were ultimately harmful for me. All of us as parents, parents do this. We teach our children this, this respect of things that could ultimately be dangerous and be harmful and we're to fear in a healthy, good way certain things. But the problem is as we get older, we exchange the things that are, that are to be properly feared and we, we put false things in there. And I don't know what you're fearing today, but God has got a word for you because it's about time we begin to see things as they really are. Write down the word fear in your notes. Some of you have probably heard a definition of fear, and it's really kind of acrostic, F-E-A-R, false experiences appearing real. That's what fear means. It's, it's the false experiences or the false expectations that appear so real, right? And when circumstances and situations don't necessarily play out the way you want them to, or they're not like how you would design them, the fact is they, they, they tend to take over so much of your focus and so much of your emotion and so much of your time and so much of your energy, and we wonder why we find ourselves coming before God empty and hollow. And God says, you need to not fear certain things. You need to start fearing the right kind of things. See, the goal of our lives as we grow in Jesus is this, replacing greater fears with lesser fears. And I'm going to argue for this. There's only one fear that the Bible commends us to, and it's this, fear God. Fear God. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, we have to understand that God is a God who is so far beyond us, so different from, from us, that we are to come before him, not with a cowering fear, but with a reverential fear. This is the beginning of knowledge. The psalmist goes on to say in Psalm 33, these words, let the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. He's a God who demands reverential awe. That's why the word awesome is such a special word, but we tend to hijack it and apply it to things that really aren't awesome compared to God. Amen? We're like, oh, dude, that song's awesome, or that chick's awesome, or that car's awesome. It's like, no, they're not. There's only one that's awesome, and that's God. Right? And yet we, we, we tend to lose sight of how awesome God truly is. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the earth is a standing on him, then this is something that we ought to consider. One more verse, Psalm chapter 2, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Notice that last phrase. The Bible will argue this, and we're going to see this today. Joy and fear work hand in hand. There is a joy that comes from fear. If you're fearful in your life right now, but there's no joy with it, you're fearing the wrong things. You're fearing the wrong things. True fear before God will bring forth joy. Is that not crazy? It seems like it shouldn't work. It seems like this does not make sense. But there's a good and healthy fear that we need to embrace. And God is going to, I, I believe this morning, get our attention about this because this is too, this is too important to pass up. 
fear God. What does that look like? Five things. Luke 12. Let's read it and let's consider what God may have for us this morning. So Jesus just got done having lunch. It wasn't a peaceful lunch. It wasn't a, a, uh, an amicable conversation over lunch. Jesus really took his spiritual fangs and dug deep into some hypocritical religious leaders. And when he left there, they were intent on destroying him. When you say the things Jesus says, and you confront people in their hypocrisy, people don't sometimes respond politely. So they're like, let's get rid of this guy. So here's this intense moment, right? Jesus leaves, and they are just bent on destroying Jesus. Verse 12. So what does Jesus do? Look at, under these circumstances, verse 1 of chapter 12, after so many thousands of the multitude had gathered together, they were stepping on one another. Literally, the word, there's 10,000 plus people. Just a mob scene around Christ. So while there are some who want to destroy, there are others who want to find delight with Christ. But then he turns to the disciples. Look what it says. He began saying to his disciples, first of all. Now, you have to understand, among this myriad, this 10,000 plus group, and again, it's not about size. It's not about numbers. Jesus never got excited about, you know, 10,000 people. Yay, we're successful. Numbers doesn't necessarily mean success. This is why he leans over to the disciples and he says these words. Because he wants us to know what true discipleship consists of. So he says to the disciples, listen to these words. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and there is nothing hidden that will not be made known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you whispered in the inner room shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends... Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that they have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom you are to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, um, has, who has killed, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, even you fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are of more value than many sparrows. I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man, shall confess him before the angels of, of God, but he who denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, don't become anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say, but the Holy Spirit's going to teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Amen. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Granted, there are some difficult places that we need to navigate today, but I, I believe with the help of God, by means of his spirit, we're going we're gonna to be able to discern what Jesus is getting at here. Five things regarding the fear of God and what it does positively in our hearts. What does the, the, the fear of God do in our hearts that is healthy and good? Number one, the, the fear of God will cultivate authenticity. See, Jesus is, has already spoken about hypocrisy. He's already spoken about trying to, to, to love God with your lips, but your heart is far from him. This is what he addressed at the Pharisee's house over lunch. And the Pharisees didn't want to have anything to do with it. And yet when you fear God and understand God is all knowing, here's what you have to realize. You can't hide. There is no hiding before God. And if you continue to think you can hide, one day there's going to be a crazy, scary revelation that God knows and sees all, and he'll reveal all. Which is crazy to think about. That God knows everything about you and me. He even knows us so much that there are things he knows about us that we don't even know about ourselves. And yet, what Jesus says is that even then... In those moments, God loves you. He is the God who has thorough understanding of your life. It is best to come clean today. 
Can I encourage you to do this today? Stop living a fake life. <laughs> Stop living in a false reality. You're, you're gonna, here's what you're going to realize. One day that your behavior, which you know this morning is not right before God, is not honest before God, it is going to fail you. The very thing we've trusted in being fake will fail us. And God invites us today to come clean before him. Can I just tell you right now, knowing that God has this knowledge of me, it's scary, but it's scary good. Because when I come clean before him and I can live my life authentically, transparently, with vulnerability, and I know that he, you guys don't know me like God knows me. And I, and I could fear you, and I can fear what you think about me, but when you live in the reality that God knows me, when I live in that reality, guess what? It makes me want to be more authentic. It makes me want to just come continually clean before him and go, his eyes see me. He sees my intentions, and he sees my motives, and he sees a heart that is genuinely wanting Jesus, even though my performance may, may, may contradict that. Even though my actions may betray my confession, my God knows the earnestness of my heart. And Jesus says, don't be like the Pharisees, because there's this thing called leaven, and, and or yeast, and when it affects the, the bread, it, it affects it thoroughly and completely. And just, just so you know, no aspect of my life is treated as if I'm hiding from God. My marriage is, is, is open before God. My, my children are open before God. My finances are open before God. My work ethic is open before God. My purity, the things I look at, the things I consider, the things I meditate on are open before God. There's no area of my life that is not being hidden from God. And I'll tell you what that does. It breeds confidence. It breeds this sense of authenticity. Can I just tell you right now? You can hide. You can hide. And you can portray an image of, of, of Christianity or faith. But God sees every part. Let me just tell you right now. Make sure every part of your life is disclosed before God. Church, stop playing games. One day, everything that you whispered in those hidden rooms is going to be declared from the housetops. Everything you thought you could kind of keep managed in the darkness is going to be exposed by the light. And Jesus says to the disciples, don't be like those Pharisees because there's a rude awakening that's going to happen to them. Can I give you some scriptures based on this? Psalm 139. God's omniscience, right? Where shall I go? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning... Dwell in the most parts of the sea. Your hand will be even there to, to lead me. He says, your right hand shall, shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. The light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. There's nothing you can do. The psalmist says, there is full disclosure of my life before you. And I'm okay with that. Isn't that amazing? When God discloses even the darkest part of your lives, he doesn't disclose it to condemn you. He does it to free you, right? Hebrews chapter 4, which Ryan used for communion this morning. Look at verse 13. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, God considers your life to be a vehicle to display his glory and to show forth his goodness. And you're going to give an account of that one day. And I pray that it's not done out of hypocrisy or falsehood. The fact that 1 Corinthians, Paul touches upon the same thing. He says this in chapter 4. Don't be, uh, therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart? Each one will receive his comm commendation from God. Here's the good news. This is not your job. This is not my job. Even though some of us feel like that's our spiritual gift. I need to point out falsehood in people. No. <laughs> Let God be the one who brings forth truth. You, truth. you just go love people with grace. And can I tell you, first and foremost, you model a life of transparency. 
you model a life of authenticity. I, I tell people all the time, you can hang out my house. The same person I am here, I'm the same person in my home. There's, there's no difference. Like what you see at, at, uh, at, uh, at the Italian you know, restaurant is the same person you see at my dinner table, same person you hear singing in the shower or whatever. It's the same person that you see singing. It's like there's no difference. And can I tell you what, how incredibly freeing that is? When you live your life in truth and honesty, I love this. This is Abraham Lincoln. You didn't think Abraham Lincoln's going to show up today, did you? He said, when you tell the truth, you never have to remember anything. When you live in the truth, you never have to continue to look behind you and make sure your bases are covered. Is that the best? Ladies and gentlemen, be authentic. When you fear God in knowing that he is the great revealer, just, just come clean. He loves you nonetheless. Point number two, which is why this next point is so important. Fearing God cultivates courage. See, when you're fully disclosed before him, you actually get this little, little pep in your step. You get this, this sense of, like, if God's for me, who could be against me? And yet, though, we live in a world where we tend to fear man more than we fear God. And that's not right. This is why Jesus says in, in verse 4 and 5, my friends, circle the word friends, only time that word appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John uses it in John 15, but in this we call the synoptic gospels, this is the only time Jesus refers to the disciples as friends. Can I just tell you right now, if you're in Christ, you're a friend of, of God. And I, and, I, and I can't think of a more wonderful word. I mean, I think of son. I think of, 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 of the phrase loved one. Like, but when you're a friend, are you kidding me? I'm a friend of God. <laughs> Imagine leading with that kind of, kind of uh, idea when it comes to your relationships with people. Hey, who are you? I'm a friend of God. <laughs> I want some of that. I want some of that. Are you a friend of God? Because when you're a friend of God, he's got you. And you don't have to fear any earthly person. Doesn't matter if it's Pilate, doesn't matter if it's Nero, doesn't matter if it's Biden, doesn't matter if it's Trump. You have no one to fear if you're a friend of God's. Look what he says. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. Fear him who can not only kill your body, but also your soul. See, men and women in this world feel they have more power than they really have. What's the worst someone can do to you? kill you that's so temporal we flex they flex their muscles like i can kill you well that is a temporal fear that has nothing to do with eternal realities think about him who can not only take care of your body but he can also take care of your soul that's the one you ought to fear because that has eternal consequences think about this God is the mighty judge, the great arbiter who will determine your fate for eternity. The, the men and women of this world may determine your fate here on earth, but this is not what matters. Ultimately, there's this thing called the eternity. I tell people, right, you know, you only die once and then you live forever. And they go, what? what? <laughs> it's true. You only die once and then you live forever. None of this YOLO thing, <laughs> right? None of this YOLO stuff. No, you, you die once and then you live forever. The question is, are you going to fear the one who has control of your life for eternity? See, we have these monoliths that are dropping into the desert. You guys know about these monoliths? And people are freaked out about them. I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? One more thing we need to fear. As if viruses and elections and, and you know, other tensions. Now we've got 11-foot monoliths dropping in Utah desert. And in Romania, and I think there's been a third location, right? And I'm going to tell you right now, I, I love the creativity of artists like this. It's like Banksy. When's Banksy going to show up? Where's he going to spray paint? What's this? And, and you know what? It's, it's fun to, to think. But there are people literally going, aliens are going to take over our world. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't fear the monoliths. Right? Don't and I'm going to tell you right now, as a work of art, it's pretty bluff. What's intriguing is the mystery behind them, right? Don't let the monoliths fear, put fear into you. There's not some alien race out there looking to take over the world. Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> fear God because he's in charge of 
everything, including the most important thing you need to consider, and that's your soul. Isaiah 51, verse 12. I'm going to give you a lot of verses this morning. Think about this. Here's what God promises. Those who fear him who can not only take your body, but also your, destroy your soul. I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you're afraid of man who dies? Of the son of man who is made like grass. Right? He, he sets this in a, in a context that says man and what they're able to do. It's temporal. It's, it's, it's got limitations. But let the one who has created you comfort you. See, ladies and gentlemen, when we fear man, we actually are being arrogant and prideful. We're basically saying we're going to put fear into someone's situation and we're not going to trust the one who's ultimately in control of all people. Pilate wasn't in control of Jesus' destiny. You know, when you think about that, you know, I love the fact that Jesus stands there before Pilate and is like, you can take me out, but you have no power if it wasn't given to you first from on high. See, what you have to understand is every human authority has a power that is given to them. They have no power in and of themselves. And when you start fearing man, you begin to take this position as if God doesn't know what he's doing. You become prideful. You become arrogant. And we need to stop and consider the fact that God says, let me comfort you. Let me encourage your hearts to trust me, even in situations you may not understand. Ladies and gentlemen, this whole season of COVID. Do you think it's just all, all of a sudden it happened and God's like, oh crap, what, what's going on now? <laughs> this was not on my radar. This was not according to my, my design, right? God is using COVID to teach us something about ourselves. Think about this. This is an important verse, what we're looking at in Luke chapter 12. Because why are you fearing that which could kill the body when you should be fearing him who can kill your soul? Think about this. COVID fears. I'm not saying COVID is not something we don't treat with seriousness. But I am going to say that there's a lot of irrational fears associated with COVID. Can I get an Amen. There's a lot of selfishness that's being exposed when it comes to COVID. Can I get an amen? We are becoming blind to more important realities because of COVID. Can I get an amen on that? We are fearing lesser things when we should be fearing greater things. And you know what? The media doesn't help. You know, all of our, all of our posts and all this stuff, it doesn't help. Here's my question is, have we allowed this season to draw us closer to God? Have we allowed this season to, to help us eliminate the things that we thought were so important and we realized it's not important? Have we taken this season to, to mend fractured relationships? Have we taken this season to, to memorize scripture, to dive into the word of God, to talk about God more than we ever have? Have we used this season to, to not quiver in the corner, which is what the enemy would want, but to, to boldly go forth and say, Jesus hasn't saved me to quiver. He has saved me to proclaim. He has saved me to be courageous. He has saved me to live on a different plane of existence. Or does your life just look like everyone else's life out there? Have you been Fauci-fied? <laughs> Have you been Trumpified? Have you been Bidenified? I don't know who you follow. All I know is I don't follow any of those people. I follow Jesus. He's the one who has saved me not to quiver, not to, to be scared of something uh, that, that, uh, that someone may say to me that's mean. He hasn't saved me that I might fear, you know, my loss of income. He might, hasn't saved me that I might sever a relationship. I haven't... He hasn't saved me that I might fear death. He has saved me so that I might have joy and life. Verses, you got it. 
Romans chapter 8. Ladies and gentlemen, what shall we say to COVID? What shall we say to presidential elections? What shall we say to an economy that may tank even worse than it's taking right now? If God's for us, who can be against us? <laughs> Full stop, period. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You might have a severance. You might be laid off. You might not get your guy in the White House. You may not be healthy. But guess what? God's still going to give you the best things. So it's now disrupting our plans, and he's saying, now it's time for my plan. I was just talking to someone before service today. Sometimes we have our plans, but when God enacts his plan, here's what we have to realize. His plan is always designed for what's best for us. Guess what? If, 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 if your guy does not get elected, God's going to, he's telling us, I'm ordaining this because I believe this is what's best for you. Figure that out. Right? If I lose my health, if I lose my job, God is saying, don't forget, I'm in control and I'm permitting things to happen because I want what's best for you. Here's the goal. Not to change your circumstances. Your goal is to change your heart. Hebrews chapter 4. So let us now draw with confidence. Come, come be, with confidence, right? Draw near to the throne of grace. Because that is your only lifeline to understanding anything that's going on. And yet we neglect this. We neglect going to him who is orchestrating all things. Pro, uh, Psalm chapter 27 verse 1. So the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom am I going to fear? What, what am I going to fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Who, who am I going to be afraid of? Here's the promise. Back to Romans 8, verse 38, 39. Uh, do you have 38, 39 on there? Neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, past, present, future. There's no powers, there's no height, there's no depth. There's nothing in creation, nothing in creation that will ever be able to destroy your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not, nothing. Stop making more of little and start making much of him who is supreme and awesome. Point number three. Fearing God cultivates security. And, and this, is, this is what this is supposed to, to bring about. This is why Jesus, <laughs> when Jesus speaks, sometimes he frightens us. He frightens me. And he follows it with some, some assurance. Isn't this good? Like, he, he's saying things that's like, fear him who can not only take your body, but also take your soul. And we're like, whoa, that's scary. And then he says, but let, let me be a tender father to you. <laughs> Think about sparrows. Think about hair. Right? Why these things? Because these are common. These are common, and I'm going to tell you, they're really valueless things. Because this is the word value. Write that word down. Value. You are highly valued by God. And the fact that you have been deemed a son, daughter, a friend, ought to be Breathe security into your soul. Think about the sparrows. Now, here's, here's what you need to understand. How many sparrows does Jesus mention in this passage? Five. You could buy two sparrows for a penny. But if you bought four, guess what they did? They threw a fifth one in. Now, I'm a bargain hunter. I'm a bargain hunter. I'm like, you know what? Buy four, get five. I'm I'm there. Remember when Arby's used to do the five for five roast beef sandwiches? My wife and I always had a joke. I go, I'm going to go get five for five. You can have one. <laughs> you know, because you can't keep up this girlish figure just on three. 
But here's what Jesus wants you to know. When they threw the fifth one in for free, that fifth one that you got free, you didn't have to pay for, is not forgotten by God. Think about that. The one that you got for free, sometimes when you get something for free, you don't treat it with value. Jesus says, even the fifth one that you got for free is not forgotten by God. <laughs> now let's talk about hair. Do you know blonde people have more hair on average than anyone else in the world? 150,000 pieces of hair average on a blonde person's head. Dark hair people, 120,000 on average. Red hair people, 90,000. I'm sorry. Anyone, any gingers out there? You've got less hair than everybody else. But isn't it interesting that God has so designed everyone with some hair, some, you know, lots of hair, medium, small. But the fact is that God, even when it comes to hair, as insignificant as we treat our hair, and we're losing it. Some of us have, have already been there and done that. We've lost it. I'm not mentioning any names, but there's some here. God knows every bit that's not only on your head, but that you've lost. Things you don't even know. I don't know how much hair I have, and I don't care how much hair I have. I say that now. Ask me in 10 years what that's like. <laughs> but here's the thing. Again, what Jesus is getting at is this. Fearing God cultivates security that he knows everything about your life, things you don't even know about yourself. And he still loves you. Are you not of more value than a sparrow? Are you not of more value than the hair? that not only do you have on your head, but the hair you've lost even today. Oh, we need to hear this. That God cares. Now, it may not feel like God cares for you. You may be going through some tough times. I, I read a story a couple weeks ago. You guys hear about the school in France? So they were having problems. Parents getting their kids to school on time, so they closed the gates. So you know what the parents started doing? Throwing their kids over the <laughs> gates. No joke. Throwing their children over, and they had to put a sign out and say, please do not throw your children over the fence. <laughs> Lori would totally do that. She's like, you're going to school if you like it or not. Get over. <laughs> the story said none of the kids had been hurt, but can you imagine a child remembering from their childhood, my mom threw me over the fence for school. <laughs> and again, it's not for, for lack of love. It's just like things happen. Now, sometimes... How many of us feel like right now like God's throwing us over the fence? I mean, it's not like he doesn't love us. It's just like, this is just awkward. And maybe it hurts a little bit, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> and when you don't clear. <laughs> and if anyone needs more help, it's Rod than anyone else, right? <laughs> no, no, just kidding. We, we kid because we love, right? But here's the thing. Even when things are not working out the way you thought they would work out, doesn't mean that God has given up on you. You're not forgotten. You are of more value than you realize. He is the, the one who is trusting. The one that we can look to and go, he's reminding us that when God's got you, nothing else can harm you. Right? Security means you need to understand that no enemy no circumstance could ever change the relationship you have with God through Jesus Christ. Oh, so good to know. Point number four. Fearing God will cultivate what? Proclamation. So, and I think, and there's deliberateness of why Jesus builds the, the, the argument he's building here about fearing God. So he wants us to be authentic. He wants us to be courageous. He wants us to be secure. When you're secure, you begin to open up more about Jesus to people. When, you, when you're transparent before God, you open up. To, when you're courageous, you open. Here's what fearing God will do. It will allow you, allow you to be more unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Write down that word, unashamed. Here's what God's not saying. That there are moments when, for some reason, you're like, I don't want to tell people about Jesus. As a pastor, this happens in my life. Believe it or not, don't, don't, don't be unforgiving. Don't be judgmental. There's times, like, when I've gotten in a plane in the past, the last thing I want to do is sit next to someone and start a conversation. Right? Because guess what they'll ask? So what do you do? And now it's out. 
now it's out. I'm a pastor. And, it, and then see, they're like, oh, okay. And they turn to the window and just look out. And then four hours, we don't even talk to each other. <laughs> and there's just times I was like, I don't want to do this. Does that mean that, uh, uh, that God's mad at me? That I don't take advantage of an opportunity? Because I'm going to tell you that there, there have been times I've been bold in proclaiming. And, and, and here's, the, here's the situation. You're not unforgiven if you don't take advantage of that opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. And we can feel a lot of weight and guilt from that. You're unforgiven if you persistently deny the work of the Spirit in you and through you. Look, look at the passage, verse 8. Everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him before the angels in heaven. So there's the court of heaven and there's the court of man. Jesus stands between God and man. He's the mediator. And Jesus is saying, you will confess me. But that doesn't mean you're going to be batting a, uh, batting a thousand. Remember the famous man named Peter? He denied Christ three times. And then post-resurrection, Jesus appears to the women and says, go get the disciples and Peter. There's a reason why and Peter is important. Because Peter feels like a failure. He denied Christ when he himself said he would never do that. He did it. How many of you have ever denied Jesus? I, I'm there. I'm counted in that number. But thank God I hear the, 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 the Lord's voice say, go, go tell Scott I'm not done with him. And then all of a sudden, God shows up and goes, yeah, you missed out on an opportunity. Doesn't mean I'm not going to line up more opportunities for you in the future. And Peter goes out and boldly proclaims. Why? Because he's been restored. Just because you're down doesn't mean you're out. Right? Doesn't mean, you know, when you're crushed, it doesn't mean you're dead. Right? All your failures are not fatal. Because I can tell you right now, there have been times I did not deliberately tell someone about Christ. But there have been times when all of a sudden I feel like there needs to be a proclamation being in a class of 150 students at ASU in a New Testament class, and they're denying, it, denying the deity of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden something happens. And I sit there and go, uh, what about this verse, this verse, this verse? And the professor recognized, like, all right, we've got someone who knows what they're talking about. As a, as a probably somewhat pompous 20, 21-year-old. Why, why then and not up? I don't know. But all I know is that Forgive yourself for those moments you haven't taken the opportunity and seize it the next time. Because what Jesus wants you to be concerned about if there's a continual outright resistance to proclaiming Jesus, you don't understand the fear of the Lord. Proclaim. Proclaim lovingly. Proclaim graciously. Proclaim truthfully. Proclaim unashamedly. Because the person that commits the unforgivable sin, and this is one of the greatest questions in all of Christianity, how do I know? Have I committed the unforgivable? Number one, if you have concern that you've committed it, you probably haven't because the person that maybe has shouldn't be concerned that they have. <laughs> Listen again. I have a family member who is questioning their relationship with Jesus Christ right now. And the concern itself indicates that there's a sensitivity to the Spirit. If you're not sensitive, I'm concerned. But if there's a sensitivity to the work of the Spirit, that tells me, why would a person who doesn't know Jesus be sensitive to the things about Jesus? You ought not fear Christian, believer, brother, sister, if you've, con con if you've committed the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is an outright resistance and denial of Jesus till the day you die because ultimately when you die, there's no second chances. Is that good or what? We need to hear this because our lives are not led in a perfect performance type way and we're going to deny Jesus sometimes. Recognize it, 
and do better next time. Last point. Fearing God cultivates confidence. And, I, and we have to end on this. And, this is, and I love how Jesus concludes this section by, by describing the fact that there are going to be some situations we find ourselves in that are hostile, that are troublesome, that are dangerous, that are uncomfortable, that are awkward, you name it. And here's what Jesus says. Trust in those moments what you've done to prepare your heart for those times that may not have happened yet, but they're coming. Prepare your heart because at those moments, the the Holy Spirit's going to draw upon everything you've done to prepare so that you could stand not to get an acquittal. This is not what Jesus is saying. Here's how you secure your acquittal when things get difficult. Here's what Jesus' goal is. No matter what situation you may find yourself in, that you're going to display the greatness of the gospel and the greatness of your God. And how is this going to happen? Because when you stand in a moment you, uh, you could never prepare for, you could never see coming, all of a sudden, there's this confidence that God is speaking. That scripture is coming out. That all of a sudden, you're saying things, you're like, I, I don't know where that came from. I sounded like Pastor Scott for a minute. I sounded like John Piper for a moment. I sounded like Billy Graham. For, I don't know who it is. But all of a sudden, God works with what you have disciplined to put into your life. Fear happens. Un, ungodly fear and unhealthy fear happens when you don't make those deposits into your soul. Because the Spirit needs something to work with. I'm talking to a customer the other day. So I've got a couple customers. You need to pray for these, these guys. Because they, they're like, hey, can I talk to you? And I'll be like, uh, what are we going to talk about so I can go home and prepare for a couple days and then we can get back together and talk about what you want to talk about? Like, no, no, no. They want to talk now. So one guy is literally like every Monday, half hour out there, I've got questions. I'm like, can you give me like a cheat sheet or something, right? Like, and you know what? He'll throw these questions out, and because there's a curiosity about Jesus, I'm just going, Lord, go ahead and just work in my heart. And say, and, and there's nothing you can prepare for, because you don't know where they're coming from. And you walk away with this sense of, of confidence and peace. And it's not a confidence in myself, it's a confidence that I have spent time with God. And I know certain gospel truths that this gentleman's sitting there going, and when you, when you respond, the wheels are turning, and he gets this little smirk on his face. I'm like, you're almost there, man. You're, you're, you're just, you're, here's the line of faith, right? You're just right there, and you're about ready to cross and, and know Jesus. And I got another other guy, a guy the other night. And he's like, you know, so he wants to talk about, like, free will and predestination. And that's like, uh, that's a sit down. We need some time to talk about this kind of conversation. But he just flat out said, but I have got a question about this. And we started talking about monotheism versus polytheism. You know, the idea of one God versus the religions that worship many gods. And we had about a 30-minute conversation where, again, I didn't know this was coming. It wasn't on my schedule for the day. And all of a sudden, we are just talking, and he's like, and he's just processing. And I just felt this sense of, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't worried. I just was like, I'm just available. And I pointed him to Jesus Christ. I just pointed him to Jesus. And that's when you feel perhaps the most confident is when you, you sit there and go, this is not about a debate, and this is not about an argument. This is about exalting and putting forth the message of the gospel. That I want these two men to know Jesus. And whatever it means to, to wiggle my way to get to that point, we're going to do it. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. But I'm not going to tell you that you, you, you don't have to prepare. Can I just tell you this? Let me close this. I'm going to give you a lot of verses right now. Prepare your hearts to be used by God because tomorrow it's going to happen and it's not on your calendar. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. 
How about storing up God's word in your heart so that you may be a useful vessel no matter where God may take you, no matter what conversation God may have for you. I think it is sin to not prepare because people need to know hope. We have a world out there where, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that you need to be ready to give an account of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect. Why? Because people are all experiencing a little bit of messed up lives right now. And if you're not storing up the word in your heart, you're sinning against God. Because this world, at this moment, with you in it, means you need to point people to Christ, because nothing is more important than that. Store up his word in your heart. What about when... when um, Jesus says in, uh, or Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, these words, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God, right? Let the words of Christ, how are we letting the words of Christ take up residency in our hearts so that it can lead to teaching and admonishing? How about Jesus himself in John 15, verse 7, saying these words, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you want, and it's going to be done. Think about this. God is writing, literally letting us have a blank check when it comes to our relationships and our circumstances and our lives right now. And he's saying, when my words take up residency in your heart, go ahead and make whatever choice you want. Go ahead and have whatever conversation you want. Because there's going to be something that the Spirit's going to work with. In this, nothing is more natural to be anxious and to be troubled and to be worried, but nothing is more supernatural when you're in those difficult moments and yet you're standing with confidence because there's something else booing you up. Man, the Word of God breeds confidence. Yes, I'm arguing to be students of the word, but not students in ac an academic sense. Be students in the sense that you are now going to go forth into the world and proclaim the majesty of Christ, the glory of God, the liberation of the gospel. Okay, remember I mentioned YOLO just a moment ago? Here's the new one, FOMO. You guys know about FOMO? You're missing out. Let me close with a fear that I have for you. That you're going to miss out on everything I've just talked about. FOMO has been popularized in a negative way because of all the social media that we have at our, at our disposal. And it's creating anxieties and nervousness in us that we're not going to be able to keep up with all the information that's at our fingertips. I'm going to tell you right now, 99.9% .9 of the information at our fingertips is not helpful anyways. Fear of missing out. Did you hear what happened to, to your football team? Did you hear what happened to the, the president? Did you ha hear what happened to, to, to the, uh, you know, Ducey? Did you, did you hear this? Did you, and, and, and we're living lives like, oh, what am I? And you know what? We're fearing of missing out on really insignificant and trivial things. My fear is that you're going to miss out fearing God. Because when you FOMO God, you don't FOMO anything else. <laughs> Tweet that. That's good right there. FOMO this. I'm going to tell you what, FOMO God. <laughs> For all you older folks out there, I'm just, I'm just trying to get you all hip on what's going on in our world today with these, these youngsters. May we be driven by the FOMO attitude that says, I don't want people to miss out on the glory of God. I don't want people to miss out on the majesty of Christ. I don't want people to miss out on the, the liberation that comes to the gospel. That's what I fear. And I think we should all join in this if you're on Jesus' team. People are missing out on trivial things. <laughs> no, they're not. They're missing out on the most significant thing, and that's a relationship with the Almighty. Fear him. That is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And all God's people said, stand, let's pray. Lord, you are too kind, you are too good, you are too, too, too merciful towards us. That we are even here in this place, gathered together and 
And there's a singular focus that we have in our hearts and our minds. Every, everything we've done today, songs and communion and time in the word, has, has been to, to, to get a glimpse of, of Christ. To understand how rich a relationship with Jesus is. And, and ultimately the overarching theme, and that is the fear that we are to have a healthy, good fear. The fear Moses had when he was before the burning bush and he trembled because he was before the one who was awesome and powerful and yet he understood there's relationship. The fear of Isaiah who before the Lord was, was trembling and, and a man of unclean lips and, and yet drew forth with confidence because you're a God who wants relationship. And so, Father, may we understand that balance of, of trembling and awe before you, but also understand the sense that we're sons and daughters and friends because of Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Father, be glorified in our lives as we point people to you and let people know that there are right things to fear and the person to fear is you. Lord, thank you for loving us, for saving us, and for giving us hope and joy and life forevermore. Direct our steps. Give us wisdom. Let us live for your glory. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. Have an awesome day, you guys. See you soon, all right? Bye-bye.